y'all, today I am here with Scott Gaeta from Renegade Game Studio. And Scott, you brought a nostalgic game that helps you through a really tough time in life, yeah? I did, I brought the Dungeons and Dragons Electronic Labyrinth game. Well, I can't wait to see it, let's go check it out. Scott, thank you for joining us. Sure, my pleasure. So this looks like a relic from mid-80s? 1980 this game came oh, okay. out. Okay, all right, that's it, pretty close. It's old, 39 years old. But this isn't where it started. No. Right. You you played D&D before this game, right? I did. I had a friend, um, I think I was eight or nine years old, Yeah. Uh, lived down the street from me, and he came over one day with a DD and d box set, and we didn't know what it was. I don't know where he got it. We went over to his house, we unpacked it, and started playing D&D. &D. We made characters. We don't even, I don't even know if we were playing right. Right. Um, we had graph paper, and we're going through dungeons, and we played that thing for weeks and weeks and weeks, and that's all we did. And it was literally like something out of a movie, right? He didn't like, know it either. No, I don't even know where it came from. I don't know oh. if, his, if his parents bought it for him or wh where he got it, it, but all of a sudden one day, D&D &D magically appeared in our lives. Right. And the whole neighborhood was playing it. I can't remember this guy's name. It's oh. really sad. Um, no name kid from down the street. No, yeah, all right. We've got to figure out. The internet must know. No name kid from down the street in New Jersey? In New Jersey. That introduced Scott to D&D &D yeah. and all things nerd. Yeah, whoever you are, contact me, you get a lifetime <laughs> supply of Renegade games. How's oh, that? I actually, go. I think that was me. Scott. Oh, was you? I think that was oh, me. Oh, all right. It, so I, do I yeah. still get the lifetime um, supply of games? Yeah, we'll talk. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that kind of developed a lot of your, your the early on, but then you moved to Florida, right? Yeah, so around middle school, late middle school. So we were playing D&D &D in middle school and, and all that sort of stuff. Like, we were the nerd kids playing D&D &D at lunch. Yes. And in, in middle school, um, you know, sure. so it was, it was sure. awesome. Uh, but yeah, then my family uh, packed up. It was like a massive migration. Like my mom and my brother and my grandparents, like everybody moved. Oh wow. Yeah. Moving in eighth grade, middle yep. school. Yep. Probably one of the worst times you could have to move and make new friends. Being a kid from New Jersey, coming down to Florida. Yeah, it's a little weird. Um, and especially being into something like D&D. &D. Remember back then D&D &D was not mainstream. It's not like right. it was today. It wasn't on TV shows and, and part of popular culture. Right. It was in a lot of ways a little counterculture. Sure. There was a lot of controversy especially around D&D. &D. Yeah, like in the South, yeah, I'm sure that was probably a little bit more sensitive than. Yeah. In Florida, I don't think Florida is quite as Bible built as say like the Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia no, no. where I grew up, but it's still, a lot of that is still there. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And then, also, right, those stereotypes kind of hold a little true, especially when you're in school. Sure. And I was playing sports and soccer, and for all I know, maybe lots of my fellow teammates were into this, but nobody talked about it. Right. Right? That's very similar to mine, and, and uh, I was playing Warcraft RTS mm -hmm. and Diablo, but I didn't really tell anybody about it because you were, that, was, that was too nerdy to really right. talk about. Right. Yeah, nobody wanted to be the first one to show up with their with their DM's guide and say like, hey, you guys want to play a game? Like, nah, that wasn't happening. Like, there's too much peer pressure going on and, sure. and, and those weird school dynamics. Oh, I mean, if I'd have walked in with a DM's guide, I would have probably been like, we would have had a holy cleansing on James. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But you still, like this particular game was something that traveled with you from New Jersey. It did, so this made, made the move. It didn't wind up at Goodwill or anything. Um, so that was pretty cool. And the neat thing about this game is that it only plays one to two players. Okay. I don't think I've ever played it as a two-player game. Really, so the, all your plays have always been solo? Yeah, it was just me playing against the game. These things are heavy. Yeah, these are awesome. These are old school minis. They, they're substantial. This game is basically Bilbo Baggins trying to steal the treasure from the dragon, okay. right? But it's D and D. Okay. So you play as as fighters, as as warriors in the game, and the uh, the dragon is hidden at the beginning of the game, and the treasure is hidden, and you have to go throughout the game. You get to move so many spaces, you hit walls, so you build the dungeon as you play, okay. and, and the walls pop up, and hopefully you've got the dungeon at least fleshed out back to your secret location. Because once you find the treasure, the dragon is after you. Sure. And now it's a it's a race, and you have to get back to to your safe room and steal the treasure and get away. Sure. Uh, so it was it was really fun. It, you know, it was the uh, that thing that kind of kept me connected to gaming. Sure. When in the rest of my day to day life, like gaming wasn't really part of my social circles and things like that. Right. Hey y'all, before we continue, real quick, we could use your help supporting the show. 
Got Scott here. He's got a new game coming out that we're going to talk about later in the episode. Yeah, Clip Cut Parks, releasing in October. That one's fun to say real fast, it right? It is. Yeah. yeah. I got to play it at Gen Con, and I absolutely loved it. Click the link below and get your pre-order in today, and it would really help out the show so we can keep making more episodes of Starting Roll. Yeah, that's one thing that's tough about when you move, even as an adult, like we just moved to LA, finding a new gaming group, right? Finding right. that connection with people to play, right. it can be hard. And, and I've done the same, like, uh, what games can I play solo? Because I just crave playing games. Right. So Yeah, for sure. So this, this, you know, obviously helped you in that transition. So what, what happened after high school? Uh, so after high school, right, went off to, went off to college. And um, when I moved into a college town, there's lots of gamers. Sure. There was a game store in town. There was a couple comic book shops in town. And I met some friends that were playing Blood Bowl. Oh, yeah. So that was pretty awesome. I had never seen a Games Workshop game. I wound up jumping in a car with a bunch of guys that I had just met. We went down to the local game shop and there was walls of minis. And yeah, they had a Blood Bowl League that they were running. So I got sucked into that right away. You know, uh, bought a team, painted up a team. We had a league, we'd have seasons, we had drafts. And yeah, played Blood Bowl for several years. So that was yeah. my re-emergence back into hobby gaming and gaming sure. with other people. Sure. Yeah, once it's in there, once it's got the hooks in you, you can't really get away from it. You might have ebbs and flows, right? But Oh yeah, for sure. What were you in college for? So I was gonna major in business administration. Okay. Um, but you know what? I got sidetracked with starting little businesses and doing things. I never finished. Okay. So I was that typical, like, yeah, this is really interesting, but maybe not for me. I was more interested in, in getting my hands dirty and doing stuff. Sure. And I was also a huge comic book nerd. <clears throat> okay. And I had a friend, that, another friend, right, that said to me, hey, uh, there's a local comic book convention in town. So there was this thing called Comic Buyer's Guide back then. Okay. It was a weekly newspaper that came out and you could buy it in comic book shops and you could get a subscription to it. And in the back, it listed comic book conventions all over the country. Okay. And there was a little tiny one at a Holiday, Holiday Inn in Gainesville, Florida, that you could rent a table for 50 bucks and sell comics. So this, this guy said, you want to split a table, 25 bucks each. And I had a big comic book collection, because that was my other thing during high school, is I would buy comics, because that was another way to, to do fun things in pop culture that was just with myself, right? Sure. You know, was a little antisocial, I guess. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I had all these comic books and we got a table and I sold a few hundred bucks worth of comics. And I said, well, this is what I'm gonna do for my job. Instead of getting a part-time job, uh, you know, making $3 an hour in sure. a college town, I'm gonna do comic book conventions. And we drove around Florida on the weekend selling comic books for extra money. Wow. Yeah. And then, so you ended up, one of the things you did in the 90s, right? You owned mm -hmm. a store, right? It was, was it comics and board games? I did. So in the late 90s, I moved to Colorado with my wife. Okay. Uh, we were both out of school and done, done with, with all that part of our life. And we decided to move to Colorado. And um, I worked, you know, regular jobs there for a while. Sure. Um, and then I decided I was going to open up a store. And I opened up a store. And at first, it was primarily comic books. And Games right, were really just Magic and CCGs. Okay. So Mag Magic had come out you know, about four years before that, and there was tons of CCGs out. Mm -hmm. And the Star Wars collectible card game had just come out mm -hmm. about a year before I had opened my store. And somebody came in and said, do you have Star Wars CCG? And I said, no, but that sounds awesome. I love Star Wars, <laughs> right? Like, right. Um, and I brought in that, and that uh, we became one of the biggest locations to play Star Wars CCG. And then Pokemon hit, right? And that was a whole other revolution in tabletop gaming. Brought in you know millions of new people into yep. into games, and the store blew up. And I got on the radar of Decipher Games. Okay. And they liked some of the marketing that I was doing in our store, and I started kind of consulting for them. They would come and ask questions, get feedback from from retailers around sure. the country, and eventually they wound up offering me a job, and I sold my store and and moved to Virginia. Went to work what was for them. the name of your store? So the name of my store was Collector Mania. Okay. Opened in the mid 90s, 97, okay. I think. And it's still there today. Oh, nice. Yeah, it's awesome. It's on the third owners and the current owners were two brothers who played Pokemon in the store in the late 90s. 
wow. And now they own the store. So that's pretty cool. That's a, you know, that's a thread that you find in, in board gaming a lot, right? People find some sort of attachment to it and they just want to stay a part of it and they find a way to make a career yeah. out of it, which is a lot of our industry, right? Like you talk to people who are just, you know, they just played it, then they want to design a game and yep. then they now they're publishers or content yeah. creators or something like that. Yeah, so. it's awesome. So you wrote Decipher. Yeah. So how did that lead to uh, I mean, now you're at Renegade. I know yep. there's a couple of other really big companies in the in the middle there. Yeah, so I started at Decipher. They gave me my big break. Uh, a woman named Monica Jones hired me, and I wound up working for her. And eventually, she moved to a different part of the company, and I kind of moved into her position. I was sure. running all of sales and marketing, and and eventually the game studio. And that was awesome. It was one of the best experiences that I've had in my professional life. Okay, uh, we got to make you know, games like The Lord of the Rings mm. and Star Trek and Mega Man and Beyblade and RPGs based on The Lord of the Rings and Star Trek and all sorts of really this cool stuff. This is my nerdy, I'm, yeah. I can't, I, I'm just, it's like dopamine's firing in all directions. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was, it was Not pretty- Not jealous at all. No, it was pretty fun. <laughs> um, so after working there for, you know, four or five years, um, I decided that I wanted to go do something else. Sure. And uh, Upper Deck was heavily recruiting at the time. Okay. They were riding high on Yu-Gi-Oh! Sure. And I was approached by Upper Deck, and I loved San Diego. So it was a natural step, and I went up going to Upper Deck. Sure. And then I was there for quite a while, working on things like World of Warcraft, and Marvel mm. Versus, and DC, and... This is my stupid smile. Yeah, face again, again, like, this was... Yeah, I mean, so this was not a, this was not a hard transition sure. for me. I just went from one group of awesome licenses that I was a massive nerd for right. to, to another group. Well, what do you think it is about board games that, you know, obviously you could have probably taken your career down the comic path yeah. or other things, right? Like, what do you think it is about board games that uh, just draws people in? Uh, I, I mean, I think they're social, right? They're a shared experience. Yeah. Um, it's that it's that water cooler experience, right? Like we can all go in, we can have an adventure, and then we can have stories to tell later mm -hmm. and and discuss those stories. And it it doesn't matter that they were make believe stories. It really right. doesn't, right? Like they're they're shared experiences, and they bring people together. Um, I, like I really think that those shared experiences can make the world a better place. Uh, can really bring people together. Sure. You know, it's it's really nice to see that gaming in North America is becoming much more mainstream. Sure. It's it's been more mainstream in Europe for a while now, uh, but it's really broken out here in North America, and it's 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 pretty cool. Yeah, I was I was really amazed last year. It was my first year to go to Essen, mm -hmm. and and going into just like some convenience stores, and they have a board game row in yeah. like convenience stores, yeah. and you're like. Wow, like yeah. that's how mainstream Germany treats board games. Yeah, it's Essen's incredible. You know, you go to Gen Con, and Gen Con is still, it's branching out, right? More general public, right. but it's still hardcore fans, right? Sure. That make the, the trip to Gen Con. But Essen is a lot of the general public. You see families with little kids, mm -hmm. and, and they just go in for one day, and they buy their games, and they're walking out with giant stacks of games, and they're yep. getting on the train, and they're going home, and you know, big giant companies that have lots of children's games will have 50 or 100 demo tables and it's filled with little kids learning yep. how to play a new game. It's, it's, it's pretty And cool. they have spiral potatoes on a stick. They do. The most delicious thing ever. Yes, right. and, and totally it's... not a plug for Renegade games, but I played uh, Clip Cut Park. Yeah. Did I say that right? Yeah, Clip Cut Parks. 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 Yeah. At Gen Con. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I think I like it more than the standard roll and write. Yeah, because it's weird though. It is weird, but I like weird. Mm -hmm. And so like quickly, in the game you're, you get a sheet, it has all these little symbols and different parts of parks, yep. and you have a pair of scissors, and you have these little cards that have like, these are the requirements that you need to put on, the, on that card, and you're making these cuts as the dice rolls, but you have to cut as many spaces as the dice tells you. Right. And anything that falls off, if you can't place it on your card, you have to wad it up and lose it and it becomes negative points. Right. So you're really like, you're like flipping this paper around and it's got cuts everywhere and you're like, well I could cut this part off and place it there, but that's not efficient. Yeah. It was really a nice little brain burner that um, I think I could literally put that in front of anyone, whether they yeah. play games or not, and they would be into it. And, yeah, and it does something different. So that game was pitched to us at Essen a year or so ago, and we, we saw that and said, wow, this is really different. It's cool. Well, there's nothing out that's doing something like that, but it's accessible. In Susan's episode, yeah. very early in the season, she really laid out that proclamation that just keep trying. There's a board game for everyone. Yep. Right? And so... Um, that's one of the things like uh, people that don't like think they don't like board games. They probably just haven't tried one that 
checks a box for them. Right. Well, and, and board games, I think, for most people, they have an image of a board game that they played when they were a child, mm -hmm. and, and modern games are very different. Right. Yes. There, there's such a broad variety of choices. There really, truly is a game for everybody out there. Yeah. You just have to find it. Well, it's funny because earlier you talked about almost how a, the board game really, you know, facilitated a difficult time for you yeah. in a solo fashion. Mm -hmm. And then also here at the end, you're talking about how it's also a, such a social, um, you know, uh, lubricant. Uh, I know that that's almost been like, a, we may have to coin that for the show. Like right. Board games are social lubricant. Um, I don't know. It's, it's just—it's funny that we get to see it a lot because we work in here, and, yeah. and, and you see the, we hear a lot of stories from our fans as far as like, hey, this game. Me and my family love this game. The best ones are just people will will email um, the company and say, you know, this game really connected with my grandmother, oh, or yes. you know, or, or my my aunt, or my brother who maybe you know he and I don't have a great relationship but we got together and we got to play a game during the holidays and sure you know those stories of people kind of coming together and maybe overcoming some of the things that kept them apart is is really pretty cool because yeah. at, at the end of the day everybody probably played games as a child yep so we, we all have that in common so to play games as an adult now is is not a far stretch just think people need a little push Right, sure. or, or just to know that there are games that are for adults and that are still enjoyable. Right, Scott, this this game is gorgeous. It it, it just wafts of nostalgia, and it was very interesting to hear how it really connected you and kept you afloat in nerddom while yep. you moved in that difficult transition. With that said, like, how do you feel like board games can help people as they're growing up and going through tough transitions? Well, I mean, in this case, right, this kept me connected to board games when I didn't have people to play with or I was I was too timid to try to find people to play with. Sure. But ultimately, I think games are at their best when we're sharing them with other people and they're bringing people together and we're having those shared experiences. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if you don't have somebody to play with, like, there are lots of awesome solo games out there and that doesn't mean you can't enjoy gaming. So I think it's just as valid to play a solo game as it, it is, is to play a, a multiplayer game. Awesome. Well, Scott, if people want to follow you and Renegade, where are mm -hmm. some of the best places they should go on social to do that? Uh, so on Twitter, we're at Play Renegade. If you want to follow me and get ramblings of nonsense, it's <laughs> at Scott Gaeta on Twitter. Um, we're also at RenegadeGames.com and on Facebook at Facebook slash uh, Play Renegade. Awesome. Well, why don't we uh, set this up and uh, go for a little dungeon diving? Sure. 